Hello, and welcome to episode 133 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We're here today with three individuals from Governing Magazine, the first of whom is Dr. Mark Funkhauser, the publisher of Governing Magazine. Mark is the former mayor of Kansas City, Missouri from 2007 to 2011. He's a former auditor of Kansas City for 18 years, former director of the Governing Institute, the author of Bring On the Funk blog, and a book, Honest, Competent Government. Mark was an adjunct professor at the University of Kansas and the University of Missouri at Kansas City and is an avid chess player. We also have Peter Harkness, the founder and publisher emeritus of Governing Magazine. He founded it in 1987, the former editor and deputy publisher of Congressional Quarterly, a fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, a recipient of an investigative reporting award by the White House Correspondents Association. And we also are joined by Zach Patton, the executive editor of Governing Magazine, who joined the staff here back in 2004 as a reporter. Gentlemen, how are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having us. Excellent. I'd like to start by asking a question of Peter. Um, what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? <laughs> I'm not doing that much anymore. Uh, I still write a column for governing, so uh, I guess that's my great uh, contribution. But other than that, I'm very much retired. Um, um, yeah, so. and so what's been driving you? What is it that at first inspired you? You had a job as a journalist at Congressional Quarterly, and you're reporting on, I mean, you're reporting on policy and legislation and, and politics, and then you decide, you know what, I need to get up and start my own organization. What, how did you come to that idea? Uh, the, uh, the thought was follow the story. Mm-hmm. I think any good journalist tries to follow the story. And in my mind, uh, after I've forgotten how many years at CQ News Service, mm-hmm. Uh, I thought the story was leaving town, and I guess I still hold to that uh, that idea. It's not it's not necessarily uh, going the way I thought it would entirely, but it it, it has in a, in many ways left Washington, and that means CQ News Service uh, covered the U.S. Congress mm-hmm. in laborious detail. It was the main service for. Uh, most uh, other parts of the media, for corporate America, for nonprofit America, uh, for really the whole Washington establishment. Um, and uh, that was great. It was a very good organization. But uh, I felt that that story didn't need as much coverage as it was getting. What needed coverage was how power and authority and innovation, Mm -hmm. responsibility were slipping out into the state capitals and on down into local governments. Now, Mark, you have experience in local government. You were the mayor of of, uh, Kansas City, Missouri. So what do you, I mean, now you find yourself as the publisher of Governing Magazine. To what extent has your experience in you know, municipal government kind of reflected the wisdom that Peter is saying, which is that a lot's going on throughout America that's really determining our strategic direction, the different policies that are being implemented. A lot of that's happening in the municipal level and on a state level. You have experience there. What are your thoughts? Well, my first thought is that Peter was right in 87, and thank God he did what he did. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, I was, I think, literally from the first issue, I was an avid fan uh, of governing and uh, read it religiously and paid attention to it. So you were a subscriber? I was a subscriber. I spoke at their events uh, and uh, and followed it uh, very closely. You were even honored by them, weren't you? I was. I was a public official of the year back in 2003. Uh, Coming here now, I think that it's even more so, mm-hmm. more true than it was then uh, for a number of reasons. One, the uh, sort of intransigence uh, in Congress uh, you know, over the last uh, eight years while Barack Obama was president uh, forced more and more uh, of the real focus uh, of delivery of services out into the, the uh, states and cities. And then looking now, um, you know, if, if the, the 
new uh, Trump administration uh, goes the way it seems to um, be indicating, I think that the, the um, emphasis and the freedom uh, in state and local government to do what they do is going to be even greater. Now, Peter, oftentimes a state legislature... Uh, Zach. Uh, sorry, um, Zach, a lot of times uh, state legislatures are viewed as the laboratories of democracy. Uh, municipalities are even more close to the ground with different constituents. Um, so I guess the idea is, are we working off what Mark just said, uh, are the state legislatures now the engines of our democracy, and how does that affect the kind of reporting that you're doing for Governing Magazine? Yeah, I think that's a safe thing to say. I think one thing, you know, thinking about what, what Peter said in terms of what the landscape was like in 1987 when, when he launched Governing, so much of that decision-making and, and, and that, that freedom and that power was, was being moved to state capitals. I don't know. I, my impression is that that the element that has changed a lot in the 30 years since then is that cities themselves have become so much more that engine, that, that laboratory of democracy, in a way that they weren't in 1987 Correct. and very much are now. Now you find these cities that are immigration havens, um, the contramanding uh, federal law. You also find states with uh, marijuana, which is still illegal according to federal law. Right, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of divergence um, and certainly the, the current political makeup that we see right now is you have pretty universally progressive democratic mayors and by and large uh, conservative Republican governors and state legislators. Uh, really, around the nation, most of the major cities' mayors are uh, uh, the left side of the political spectrum? Oh, yeah. I think of the top 100 cities in terms of population, there's four Republican mayors, five Republican mayors. Um, there's even, and there's a hot, strong correlation with urban populations and Democratic uh, leaning electors, correct? That's true. The other thing that's really interesting about that is when you get down to the local level, the kinds of partisan splits that, that really d divide state legislatures and the Congress here, um, they don't they don't shake out in exactly the same way. I mean, one one of the most prominent Republican mayors in the in the country is Mick Cornett of Oklahoma City. He is involved in a lot of um, sort of wellness programs and a lot of uh, kind of placemaking and quality of life uh, it, it fo uh, focused programs, uh, transit and kind of you know. Uh, redoing their downtown to make it more walkable, stuff like that that, that, that you might not think of as, as maybe Republican ideals. But again, when you get down to that on-the-ground level, um, the partisanship it just isn't the same kind of divisive thing that it can be at the state level or the national level. So Mark and Peter, would you care to comment on what Zach was just saying, which is that on a more local level you're seeing less room for partisanship in fixing sidewalks and potholes and making sure the trash gets picked up on time. I, I would say that's true, but it's seeping in. Totally. I mean, it is working its way down the, the, the partisanship uh, into uh, state and, and local governments in, in a way that uh, was probably not the case in, in 1987. But is, is there a historical precedent for this? I know a lot of times people are very prone to saying, well, this is the worst time ever, but of course, you know, there's been the Civil War and there have been fist fights in Congress. Is, is partisanship seeping down to the local level for the first time right now, or, or is there precedent? Oh, no. I mean, I, I think these, these things come in cycles, but I, but I do, I think uh, Mark's right, uh, that the, the paralysis disease has spread out of Washington, particularly to uh, state capitals, mm -hmm. and then on down to locals, although I don't think it's affected those as much. Mm -hmm. And I even see a new kind of uh, activism, a new kind of politics, uh, that's developing, even in red states where you would think, oh, you know, they'd never do that. It's, it's government people helping to involve governments in what are basically private or nonprofit activities. A uh, good example uh, is uh, we have a place up in uh, northern Michigan mm -hmm. 
Uh, and it's interesting that right after uh, Trump took office uh, and and became clear that he was a fossil fuel guy and mm-hmm. that the the uh, the new kinds of energy were on the outs. Traverse City, Michigan, voted two days later mm-hmm. uh, to convert the entire city over to uh, non-fossil fuels to renewable energy within the next five years. Now that that's also interesting because Michigan was one of the three kind of key battleground states that actually allowed President Trump to win the Electoral College. Isn't that is that uh, counterintuitive that you would see them taking action in a particular part that's contrary to his in- interest in advancing fossil fuels? Maybe. I mean, I could see how, how it kind of appears as, as counterintuitive, but again, I think it goes back to this idea of cities being this engine of change, sometimes in a way that's very, in, in the opposite direction of kind of how they, how that, the state that they're in. Um, and the definitions moving. aren't so rigid right. Right down at the local level. But people just say, well, let's get the job done, yeah. whatever it is. It's interesting, Benzie County, where we have our place, is one of the most conservative and poorest counties in Michigan. Mm-hmm. And it went for Trump. And yet they just, you know, have started this effort where they define what the 20 major problems in Benzie County are. Mm-hmm. Uh, opioids, uh, you know, uh, homelessness, and mm-hmm. all kinds of things. And how do we address those problems? And going to the root of what causes the problems and, and define that then put together a public, private, religious effort, all of the uh, resources of the county to go right at those problems. And now, that, that's, you know, in a lot of places that would be called lefty. It's not really. So, Mark, when you were uh, over at Kansas City, before being mayor, you were an auditor for a number of years, and, and a big part of your platform was fiscal responsibility making sure that money wasn't being wasted, that you weren't being scammed by utility companies. Um, Yet, what party did you run to represent? Well, uh, in Kansas City and in many cities, it is nominally Mm nonpartisan. So it's the the top two finishers on the ballot Mm -hmm. running against each other uh, in the general election. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, having said that, the town is very much a Democrat town. and I thought I was a Democrat. Uh-huh. Uh, many of my constituents thought I was a Republican. Interesting. Uh, it, it's interesting. If you emphasize uh, you know, human rights and social justice and you know, helping the vulnerable, people assume you're a Democrat. Mm-hmm. If you emphasize fiscal responsibility and paying for what we're buying, yeah. uh, people assume you're a Republican. But they're not mutually exclusive. They are. They are, they are, they are <laughs> you cannot help the poor and vulnerable when you are broke. Right. <laughs> so, so to me, now I say, you know, I thought I was a Democrat. I... I if it had been a traditional primary, mm-hmm. I would never have gotten remotely. I had not paid my dues. I yeah. had not served a, a Democratic Party. Mm-hmm. I was not part of the machine. Uh, and the machine was not thrilled when I got elected mm-hmm. uh, and set about you know, uh, setting me straight mm-hmm. uh, so that within six months I, I realized I was actually an independent. So are you finding, Zach, when you're looking around the countries at different states and cities, are you finding that list of priorities that Peter mentioned about Upper Michigan? Are you finding any general commonalities, or there's a lot of variance between different regions? Um, I don't know. It seems, again, when you drill down to the local level, it seems like there are some pretty common elements. Everybody wants their streets paved. Everybody you know, wants to not deal with potholes. Um, Everybody needs their garbage picked up. I mean, so those local issues, um, the, the sort of bread and butter issues that a mayor deals with, mm-hmm. aren't aren't that kind of unique around the country. So, in that sense, I want to get a little bit more into what you gentlemen, what really motivated you to pursue this career. Uh, just continuing on those lines, Zach. If all these different municipalities and, and, and the state, states to some extent have similar priority lists, what is it that intrigues you about this? Why is that not boring? Why have you chosen to go into this field and, and dedicate your career thus far to reporting on what may appear to be very similar stories? That's a, that's a good question. So I will just say for me, um, I actually started at governing as an intern in college. That was my first exposure to governing. 
uh, and then had a few other uh, journalism jobs after college. But for me, as soon as I got here and started looking at this universe of, of state and local government, the thing that that I think you that might come across as kind of boring and, and common problems is exactly what I think is so interesting about what we do. It is common problems and a lot of really common priorities, but you see this county in Florida doing something really innovative as a way to address this same problem that all these other counties are dealing with. Or you see, you know, the, the state of Nevada doing something really innovative. And so it's these shared goals, these shared problems that states and localities all have. What, what drives me here at Governing is our ability to kind of highlight what is really working you know, it's the, to go back to what you said about laboratories of democracy, it's exactly that model. Mm -hmm. Except, I think that, you know, laboratories of democracy initially was kind of conceived as this notion that, you know, a state would try something and if it worked, well, then the federal government could implement that and try it. That doesn't have to be the case. You know, you, you can copy something that you see a different state doing um, that, that's working really well for them and solving the same issue that you're doing. So, Peter, when you really when you went and started this organization, this magazine, were you thinking that one of the main kind of value drivers that you were thinking of that would increase subscriptions and really provide value through this magazine would be that you'd enable different counties and municipalities and states around the country to kind of use Governing Magazine as a as a pool of good ideas to as a, as an idea exchange to help. Uh, best practices expand around a nation was that a motivating factor? Oh, no question. That, that was absolutely right. And and uh, my impression, my feeling, at, particularly at that time, mm -hmm. was that states were very open to it. Mm -hmm. Similar laws would sweep across the country and be passed by 50, 60 percent of the states. And then, lo and behold, two, three years later, after they finally get their act together, the Congress would would in effect implement that, that idea and make it a national law. The one that that I remember that really made me think that we'd, we'd gone the right direction was uh, when Congress finally passed a uh, welfare reform bill. Mm -hmm. That came out of the upper Midwest, out of uh, Wisconsin and, and, uh, and Michigan. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's some question now whether, and, and it seemed to work at the time. There's That's, some question now whether it, it's, it really has or It's not, almost but. in the constitutional model. There was actually intention written into the Constitution that said if you wanted an amendment to the Constitution, you needed to get legislatures to pass these laws. Exactly. First. So it's almost written into our very democratic representative government structure, the foundational documents of how you're going to start in the local level and, and have them work in concert with the national level. That's right. I don't want to make it sound too nicey-nice, though, because uh, this whole pattern, I, th I think, I don't know what, uh, what you guys think, but I think the pattern has been disrupted in the last five to ten years because uh, it's, it's now so much more ideological. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, whether it's a Republican state or a Democratic state really matters more than it used to. Mm -hmm. Uh, cities are uh, more democratic to the point where state legislatures now are intervening and stopping cities from doing certain things. Hmm. So, Mark, I wanted to go back to you. First of all, as a subscriber to the magazine while being an auditor and then while being uh, a mayor, were you actively getting ideas from Governing Magazine that you were able to later implement in your exec in an elected uh, role? And then also... Uh, since Mark, since Peter just spoke about how uh, in the last 10 years you've seen increasing partisanship occur at the expense of being able to implement best practices, and you were mayor within the last decade, were you able to, can you comment on that? Would you say that ideology was, it was getting in the way of, of adequate implementation of the ideas that you might have read about in Governing Magazine? I, I don't... Uh... I agree with the premise, as I said earlier. I think it's sort of the ideological partisanship fighting is, mm -hmm. is, is seeping down, uh, and it certainly is worse you know, in the last 10 years than it was before that. It didn't really stop us from doing things mm -hmm. in Kansas City. Um, you know, we, w like all cities, we had to negotiate with the state legislature on stuff, uh, but I don't think 
I, I can't point to a particular innovation or idea that we had where there was sort of a, a, a partisan reason why we couldn't do it. Uh, it was, uh, you know, and, and in terms of why I as a subscriber would, would read the magazine, mm -hmm. well, if you're interested in government, this is like required reading. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it, it is uh, interesting uh, be above and beyond everything else. I mean, uh, who the characters are, how different people are grappling with the uh, ideas. Uh, you mentioned the book that I wrote. The whole premise of that book mm -hmm. is that the challenges that we face are very much part of the human condition. They're, they're similar everywhere. How to raise your children, you know, and so on and so forth. What's interesting is the diverse way in which people have grappled with that challenge. Those are very different. And so looking across the United States or across the world and seeing how cities, every city wants to fix its potholes, they don't all do it the same way. That, you know, and, and the players. I was always interested in, you know, I, and I tell people now, I tell our reporters and the people that I speak to, mm -hmm. uh, public officials are interested in three things. Uh, they have an agenda that they want to push. Mm -hmm. They ran for office. They got elected. They, they became city manager because there was stuff they wanted to get done. They got three things that move them: information, you know, facts and data. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we saw the other day in one of our story meetings, our, our health editor said that uh, the highest uh, maternal mortality rate in the United States is, t is in Texas. And if Texas were a nation, it would be first in the, in the developed world. That's interesting. That's interesting information ideas about what to do about what you find, and then allies. Who else is working on this? Nobody gets anything important done by themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you're a mayor, you want to know who else is, is you know, in fact, the first thing they always ask you, who, who else is working on this? Yeah. You know, and both in private sector and public sector. Do they need to be stakeholders local to your it, area? Or uh, no, it does not have to be local to your area, uh, but it is... Uh, it is important that they be a peer mm -hmm. and that you have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. When I did my dissertation, it was on the diffusion of innovation mm -hmm. and the whole idea that the, the final mile, as it were, mm -hmm. in innovation is, you know, that would make you adopt a new innovation is if you and I are peers and we have a face-to-face -face conversation mm -hmm. and you say, well, how'd that work out for you? And I say, well, I did this and that and I learned this and that. And you say, well, I'm going to give that a shot. But I have to say that for me is one thing that I love about covering the public sector as opposed to if, maybe if we were to cover the private sector, which of course we don't. But it's like if Coca-Cola came up with this really cool new marketing strategy and Pepsi was like, can we come over and just, you just tell us what you did and we just watch what you're doing and Coke says, of course, come on in. <laughs> you know, obviously that doesn't happen in the private sector. It happens all the time in the public exactly. sector and we like to think of our mission as, as kind of facilitating that and, and bridging that. Well, and it, it helps that we're an established media company. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there are good ideas come out of Brookings and the Urban Institute and Pew and all these wonderful folks, mm -hmm. but they're in a little echo chamber mm -hmm. here in D.C. talking to each other. Mm -hmm. We're out there talking to the mayor of Abilene. I mean, you know, or Des Moines or Traverse City. I mean, and, and so we are a good professional media company. We're expert at sort of spreading this stuff around. For me, you know, coming here from public, uh, the public sector, from mm -hmm. public life, this is like I'm in the catbird seat. I mean, this is the coolest thing in the world. There's one other factor that we haven't talked about that I think is important is uh, in the original definition, and I think it still holds true, we were supposed to cover politics because that's how the, the system, you know, stays well-oiled. Mm -hmm. Policy, which is what the politics makes, mm -hmm. and management, mm -hmm. right. and management. Right. Uh, it wasn't just about uh, what it is we're going to do. It's how well we do it. Right. And so, say, the whole reinventing government movement really started in the front cover of Governing Magazine when the two authors, who do not work for governing, mm -hmm. uh, basically took their premise and, and made it a cover story, and it went from there. I think it's questionable uh, how well it worked in the, in the long run, 
it would depend on what level of government you're talking about, federal, state, or local. And my guess is it didn't work at the federal level. You're saying management didn't work? Fe no, reinventing government movement. Reinventing government movement. The, the whole different way of thinking about how you manage pu public enterprises. But anyway, all of that plays out in the pages of, gov of governing. Mm -hmm. uh, and and pe a lot of people look to it uh, for uh, ideas about how you managed rather than what you managed and, and to what end. Sounds like the goal is to have your readers just become aware of what else is going on. You want to be a forum of ideas. Does that resonate? Yes, that's right. I think it's important, though, for us on the editorial side to keep in mind, while we do have this mission of kind of spreading good ideas and, and highlighting good innovation, we're, it, we're not cheerleaders for government. I mean, we want to call out and, and focus on uh, on programs that have not worked, especially kind of on the management side. We're, you know, we're pretty agnostic in terms of specific policy goals. But the question is, okay, you have established what your policy is. How effective are you at making that happen and just, you know, making things work? That's that's what we want to look at. It's uh, for, for me, the objective is better government. Yeah. I mean, I want government to do a better job of making the streets safe, of facilitating uh, prosperity, clean air, clean water, uh, you know, a healthier population, more successful students. I mean, government exists to help us solve problems that affect all in common. Mm -hmm. And I want it to do it well. Mm -hmm. you know, and this is a great mechanism or, or fulcrum to make it work well. One other thought uh, about the about how things have changed, I think, is that aside from management, it's also the, something that's becoming new in government, and I think is a growing trend, mm -hmm. is a government's ability to bring in other players. It can't do it by itself. I can't think of a better example than rebuilding Detroit. Mm -hmm. That is a story, an uh, unfolding story, that may be even more positive than we're saying right. uh, because of heavy involvement from... Uh, private enterprise, nonprofits, uh, all kinds of different people who have nothing to do with government mm -hmm. brought together, uh, sometimes, as in the case of private sector, pursuing self interest. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, Quicken Loans owns 47 buildings in, in the old downtown Detroit. <laughs> they're, it looks like they're going to make out like champions. Uh -huh. uh, but but they, have, they have planted the seeds for the new Detroit. And and uh, and I think that's a growing trend. I think you're going to see more and more of that. And so, what government is is being redefined, and we have to keep up with that story. So, as we approach the end of the podcast, I like to suppose. So, I'd like to ask you guys about mentors. How did you figure out exactly? Was there anyone that you modeled yourself after and say that's the kind of you know, Mark, that's the kind of politician I want to be. That's the kind of auditor I want to be. That's how I understand what good governance is all about. Or, uh, Peter, did you, was there a journalist who, maybe a Congressional Quarterly or elsewhere, who said, you know what, really, and, and it's interesting because in normal journalism, in other journalism, you think, I want to create the most information possible for regular citizens to make informed decisions and hold power accountable. But here you have a, you have a different audience that says, I want the policymakers not, not really to, to hold each other accountable, but to really know what they're doing. And then, Zach, you know, maybe you had a mentor. Maybe either of these two men might have been mentors to you. Or, or how exactly is it that you're able to say, well, we not only want to report, you know, good government, but also bad policy ideas so that we know what didn't work in order to create better government. So open it up to you gentlemen to speak for a moment about who your mentors are and, and, and how they, they taught you exactly where, you know, what path you ought to trot? I would, uh, I, two places I would look. One, uh, when I came to the state auditor's office in Tennessee, which was entirely by accident, mm -hmm. uh, m my boss was Frank Greathouse, the state auditor, a crusty old CPA, southern guy, and he just assumed that we would be the best in the country at what we did. He assumed that we would be players, that we would, if you had a question about what the audit standards were, you would call GAO and you would tell them what you thought it ought to be. And it was incredible sort of permission mm -hmm. to be 
at, at a brash young kid in the, my early 30s to get on the plane and go to tell the Comptroller General of the United States, look, in Tennessee, we think you ought to do X. You're not doing it right. <laughs> uh, and I had opinions and ideas, but to be given an absolute free reign to run with them uh, and to know that the boss is going to back me up uh, was was really empowering. And then the second place I would look is not a specific human being, although there are a couple that probably popped to mind, but when I became a mayor, I was, I had worked for directly for elected officials, including several mayors, mm -hmm. uh, for 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I became a mayor, I was so enamored and impressed with so many of the mayors that I met. I just thought, you know, I mean, uh, Richie Daly in Chicago and some of the others, I just thought, God, this is a, you know, if I could do what these guys are doing, this is cool. Um, I guess my two key ones are both journalists, uh, Eugene Patterson, uh, who had been the editor of the uh, Atlanta Constitution and became the uh, head of uh, the newspaper company, the, what now the Tampa Bay Times in Florida, that owns, owns us. And he was the one who had to clear the way for putting aside some, the millions of dollars to get governing started. Mm -hmm. And he just recognized it as a great idea. It was competing with other great ideas that, that fellow uh, uh, executives at uh, Congressional Quarterly were offering to him, and I, and I thought they were very good ideas, mm -hmm. like getting preparing the way for the Internet age. Mm -hmm. um, and they were absolutely right. But, but Gene, when I said what we have to do is follow the story, that really played to Gene's interests, and and uh, and uh, so we got started. And then he was he was great at just sort of uh, not giving lots of advice, but just saying keep at it, keep at it. You're doing the right things, blah blah blah. The other one is uh, David Broder, who was the report a uh, columnist, and I think he was political editor of the of the Washington Post. The reason was that he was not so enamored of the Washington story that he didn't see. What what I had thought I was seeing too, and he he gave me some reason to believe I'm not crazy. <laughs> so uh, I'm very fond of David. For me, I mean, obviously Mark and Peter in the room are, are mentors. I, I, <laughs> I have to say that. Aside from professional pressure, so. <laughs> uh, you know, I think the 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 single biggest mentor for me is is. My predecessor in this position, uh, Alan Ehrenholt, who uh, was the executive editor of Governing from, was it 92? Right around 92, er, yes. Early 90s uh, until uh, 20, 2010. Uh, we actually have him back on staff now as a senior editor, but, um, you know, Alan has this just innate ability to help you cut through the noise of a story and, and really figure out what is really going on and what's really important. And I, I think that we, um, you know, especially being kind of in this D.C. echo chamber here, there is a lot of noise and there's a lot of this sort of daily story or hourly story that honestly just doesn't really matter. And being able to kind of cut through that and get to what is actually useful in terms of a story and what's what's interesting, of course, but like what what's kind of actually help somebody, you know, uh, in, in their understanding of the way they do their job or in their understanding of, of kind of their corner of the world. Um, so, Zach, just to follow up off that, what is worth it? What does matter? What constitutes good government? Why would it be something to wit worth your while, worth each of all of your whiles? Why would it be, why would the pursuit of trying to make government a little bit more perfect, trying to improve services, why does that matter? Why would you dedicate your lives to that? Why try to advance the public interest? It's an interesting question because I guess it seems so kind of self evident. <laughs> why, why wouldn't you? But, um, you know, I think it goes back to the point that Mark was making before. Or making before. We, we have made this compact to have a government. And there are 
great disagreements about the size of that and what makes sense and what falls within that scope. But we, you know, have, have come together to, to agree that we're going to have a government. And so why wouldn't you want to do everything you can to help that be as efficient as possible? And I, I think, you know, like Mark was saying, there's there's how you talk about an issue frames the way that people kind of think what your perspective is. I think when we talk about government efficiency or, or um, so sometimes those come off as, as, you know, maybe we mean shrinking government or whatever. And again, as, as, a, as a publication, we're really agnostic on that stuff. But figuring out what you want to do, how you want to serve the people, and doing that in the best way possible. And if we can play a role in, in helping that, to me, that's, that's all the motivation I need. I think the quality of your public sector says a lot about the quality of your society. Well, you know, basically you can look around the world and you can see where government has failed, uh, and it's uh, it's not good. Uh, you, you know, for for me, there are like two reasons. One, I'd like to do something I'm good at, and it turns out. By accident, you know, <laughs> turns out I'm good at this. Uh, damn, who uh, knew? And, and so that's one thing. And, but then the second thing is, is that you know, I love my wife, I love my children, I want them to live in a in a sane, decent world with, as I said, clean water, clean air. Look at Flint, Michigan. Look at Beijing. If you've ever been to China, it's awful. You know, the air quality. I mean, you can't breathe. Well, you know. How do you fix that stuff? Well, you only fix it through government. That's the only way to fix it. So that has been the executive staff at Governing Magazine, Dr. Mark Funkhauser, the publisher of Governing Magazine, the former mayor of Kansas City, Missouri, former auditor of Kansas City, former director of the Governing Institute, former adjunct professor at uh, University of Kansas and University of Missouri, Kansas City, uh, author of a blog and a book. You have uh, Zach Patton, the executive editor, um, a longtime staff of Governing Magazine, and Peter Harkness, the founder and publisher emeritus of uh, Governing Magazine, former editor and deputy publisher of Congressional Quarterly, fellow at National Academy of Public Administration, and recipient of a White House Correspondents Association Award. They speak about their lifetime in public service as being dedicated towards uh, making be government better, um, trying to uh, bring others into the fold and, and, and improve policy, good policy, try to in, uh, create an environment where politics um, leads to good policy and, and good adequate management. Um, cut, they're trying to cut through noise and trying to find what's important, understanding that the quality of the public sector reflects upon the quality of society. There are good policies, bad policies, and the important thing at the end of the day, according to this gentleman, is having the persistence to report on all of these and having the courage to make sure to, to provide a forum in which both good and bad policies are presented to readership uh, around the nation uh, from multiple levels of government where you can see what works, what doesn't, so that this, even though we have similar challenges, you present a diverse array of new solutions um, that can lead to uh, an improved society and, and improved lives for Americans uh, across the nation. Gentlemen, I'd like to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. And this has been episode 133 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Remind you to subscribe at publicinterestpodcast.com, listen on iTunes, um, listen on, uh, on a podcast app, on an Apple product, SoundCloud, um, Stitcher, numerous other platforms. Should you wish to contact Dr. Funkhauser, Mr. Patton, or Mr. Harkness, you can leave a voicemail for them at the phone number listed on the Contact Us page of the website. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.